You are listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ask a Gettysburg Guide number seven. As always, I'm sitting here with Bob Steenstra. Hello, Bob. Hello, Matthew. And How have you else? been? We haven't done uh, an Ask a Guide in a while. Okay. Yes, and part of that is because uh, the winter lecture series take up so much space on the feed that yes. um, by the end of the month, like I'm running out. So I haven't really been doing any of these. And but it doesn't matter because they're wildly popular. They're getting uh, tons of downloads. So I'd like to thank everybody. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, the National Park Service puts on lectures throughout the winter. You know, because who wants to go out on the battlefield? So they bring you into the warm auditorium, and then in the middle of the lecture, they turn on the air conditioning. Do you notice that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like in the middle of the air conditioner, I'm freezing. But any or in the middle of the lecture, I'm freezing. But anyway, they uh, um, they do that. It's uh, it's really I love it. It's really cool. Mm-hmm. And um, we record them and we put them up for you guys to, to hear for free. And that's all possible because of our patrons over at Patreon. We're up to 27 patrons 27. now. 27. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you, patrons. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I probably wouldn't be able to do it if it weren't for them. So thank you very much, patrons. And if you like that stuff and you like all this free stuff, please consider going to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and becoming. A patron. Matt, there's another reason why it's been a while. Uh, I hurt my back. You've been a pain in the back. Oh no, you <laughs> had a pain in the back. <laughs> yes, yes, I hurt my back. Poor Matt. Well, it's okay. You know, I hurt my back trying to work out. <laughs> That'll teach you. Yeah, right? trying to, yeah. And I, and I said to my doctor, I'm like, Peggy, I'm never you taking your that. advice <laughs> ever again. Because that was the doctor's orders, and uh, that's that. But anyway, today we're going to be discussing a plethora of interesting topics that you, the listener, have sent us. And we're going to ask uh, a licensed guide, as always, for the answer. And in this episode, we're going to, or in this episode, we're going to cover Culp's Hill, um, entrenchments and burial pits, decisive battles of the Western theater. And a Barbara Walters style question from the great Trinetti is going to round things out. Our guest guide today has been licensed since 2008. Prior to that, he was an IT director in higher education. And most importantly, he leads tours for our sponsor, Getty's Bike Tours. So welcome to Bruce Rice. Hello, Bruce. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, but I'm wondering where's the band? The band? The like, ba- like Johnny Carson? Yeah, like the lead in, all of those great sound effects you have. Yeah. Oh, there's no band here. I don't do that, but this is stripped down. You know, he's not have a live band. <laughs> this is no, no live band, no, just we open up with one little thing and, and that's it. It goes right into the show. This is stripped down. We'll make do. Okay, so the first question that we're going to get to uh, comes from Dan. He's one of our listeners who found us on YouTube. And he has two questions. What is the most interesting vehicle that you have driven as a guide? And are there any funny stories about driving while giving a tour? Yeah, well, on the uh, interesting vehicles, I'll start with one I don't like. Uh, My apologies to any Hummer drivers out there. But (laughs) the Hummer's got to be the most uncomfortable car in the world. Um, Really? They they shut down operations uh, uh, several years ago, but I understand they're coming back with the new improved Hummer. So oh, great. we'll see how that goes. That's fantastic. That's not my favorite. Uh, the Jaguar XJ was absolutely my favorite. Um, I'm actually surprised I was able to drive it. I went with the uh, owner and his girlfriend, and as we walked to the lot, I saw it. And I said, "It's a nice car." And he tosses me the keys, and I'm like, should I be driving this car? <laughs> he says, "He says, well, can you drive a stick? Well, I, I learned on a stick. Sure. No worries. I learned a couple things about Jaguars on that tour. One is they don't like to go slow. Mm. Um, the other is the clutches on those things are very tight. Oh, yeah. So coming right out of the parking lot, I killed the engine. <laughs> and I apologized. And he was okay with that. He says, well, that's fine. He says, she does that all the time. Uh, uh, <laughs> that made me feel good. <laughs> so after after uh, breaking the uh, clutch a few times, um, I'm learning that you really have to, you've got, about, uh, you've got about a quarter of an inch of play between completely disengaged and completely engaged. Mm-hmm. So I'm out there on the Emmitsburg Road and on the Millerstown Road. Those who know the tour know that when you sit at the stop sign, you're on a little bit of an uphill and you have to give it a little more clutch to mm-hmm. get it going. 
so I clear the way and I end up popping the clutch and laying a patch across the Emmitsburg Road. <laughs> At that point, I pulled over and I said, maybe, maybe you should drive. <laughs> so that was that was interesting. That a little, little too much car. Has caused a lot of blood to be shed. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, right I, there, I right. have never driven a Corvette and most guides haven't because they're two seaters and most Corvette owners have somebody with them. So. Mm -hmm. Someday, maybe. Yeah, maybe just one person in a Corvette will come. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Bob? I am oblivious to types of vehicles, Matt. Really? Yes. I, but you've never, like, driven in a car and said, wow, this is a nice car. And yeah, I've offered a couple times to switch cars instead of giving me a tip for my old 2012 Honda Accord, <laughs> which is dented all over the place. That happened just this Saturday. But you got another for some dent? Reason to no, I offered to switch cars. Oh, so oh. Someone had a nice SUV, and I, I don't, I'm not into cars. Okay. I drive 10-year-old cars. I mean... The 2012 is my nicest car. The, the car is a tool for you. Yeah. It's a vehicle. Yeah. Literally a vehicle yeah. just to get from point. I'm kind of the same way with cars. Ni I love Jeeps. Though. Nicest vehicle, though. One time my touring bicycle was out of commission and I had to take my nice sleek carbon racing bike. And that was a mistake because you have to have cleats that you can't walk in. And uh, it was raining. It was a journey through hollowed ground. Yeah, I remember that. Even, was that was, was last year? No, 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 this, no, was, no. Back this was when you owned the business. Back oh, okay. in the, in the 2000 aughts or whatever. Okay. So anyway, you don't want it. But let's move on. All right, so no, no car for you. No I car for I'm you. Not, I'm not attentive. All right. Well, very good. Then we'll move on to the next question, and uh, we won't uh, be attentive to your wasn't inattentiveness. There, wasn't there bad ones? Well, well how about well, any funny... Well, you gave me some funny stories, but do you have any funny stories, Bob? Um, I already did sort of give you one in a previous time, just that time that there was a, a real good-looking girl and her boyfriend I was giving a tour to that were having a fight. Yeah. Did you say this on the show? I don't think I don't you said know, it on the show. Okay. Then I'll say it again. <laughs> okay. And, and the boyfriend was sitting in the back seat, and the girlfriend was sitting in front seat and I was driving her car. I don't have an idea what kind of car it was because the girl was really stunningly beautiful. I'm sorry, my wife. I hope you're not listening to this. But I'm sure she, she's not. <laughs> you're right. She's a Quaker. <laughs> but anyway, she, the, the, the girl, when we were out there by Barlow's Knoll and I'm talking about Francis Barlow being uh, hit you know, in the leg and having needing an amputation, she reaches over on my leg with her hand and begins tracing places with the question, well, where was that amputation, oh Bob? Was gosh. it here? And she's like right above my knee, which is where it was. Or, and she goes up, up closer up my thigh, or was it here? Really? And she's getting close. Yeah. And it was very uncomfortable. And her boyfriend was there? Yeah. I think they, she, had, they she were had, they had spat. something going on. Exactly. Yeah. And I think she was trying to uh, spat or no, I don't know. Yeah. All and right. I was young back then i mean yeah. this was i think my first or second year i was young. okay i would say Back, good uh, looking when you had the barry manilow hair is that uh, the yeah. feathered the feathered uh yeah farrah fawcett barry manilow yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey let's move on you know at least you have hair um okay can you please discuss the building of entrenchments on culp's hill if Geary was so against them why were they built by his men can we give them another name Sure. What else are they known as? Matt? The breastworks. Uh, the, uh, the breastworks. Yes. And um, that is different from a trench in that a trench is dug all the way into the ground. The breastwork is a combination of digging and piling rocks and logs and that sort of thing. And in the rocky ground around Gettysburg, uh, breastworks were preferred. It would take you it's forever. easier to pile up. Yeah, it would take yeah. you forever to dig a four-foot uh, trench. So Sure. Uh, and then the follow-up says, what is the original source for this quote about soldiers fighting behind entrenchments? So again, it's breastworks. And something to the effect that once they fight behind entrenchments, they will never fight in the open again. It has always confused me as to why he allowed his men to do it, despite he supposedly being so against it. Bruce, clear this up for us, please. I'm not going to clear it up. I'm oh. probably going to add more uh, doubt or confusion. But uh, I personally believe that the source of that whole controversy, as it's sometimes called on Culp's Hill, goes back to the esteemed uh, Harry Fonz in his book on Culp's Hill. What page are you on there, Bruce? I am on page 114, and I will read what is said about that. Now, the general who um, is generally credited with ordering the construction of breastworks on Culp's Hill was a brigadier general by the name of General uh, George Green. Mm -hmm. uh, his boss, the division commander, was General John uh, Geary. 
And according to the uh, account is that Gary uh, is not exactly thrilled about the idea of these men on Culp's Hill digging in behind breastworks because in his words, once they become accustomed to fighting behind breastworks, they are ruined for a good stand-up fight. Okay. Um, I'm gonna read the source from that and uh, what Spons has to say about that is he says that Gary conferred, excuse me, Gary conferred with his brigade commanders and gave them the option of entrenching or not. Okay, important. He gives them the option. Mm-hmm. And notice it's not just green, it's all of the brigade commanders, which includes a first corps brigade that's over there, General Wadsworth's first four, first corps uh, brigade. Gary said that he was opposed to doing so because he believed that it unfitted men for fighting without them. Green replied that saving lives was more important than such theories and that his men would build them if they had time to do so. Uh, The story received some support from a Captain Charles P. Horton, Green's adjutant, who wrote that they were not orders uh, to entrench, but that the permission to do so was given by Gary and his brigade commanders. And then we have the footnote. So so for all of the uh, nascent... uh, Uh, historical research out there always follow the footnotes. Footnote 14 goes to discussions between um, John Batchelder, the early historian of the Battle of Gettysburg, and many different people Mm -hmm. who are giving accounts of what happened sometimes in the months and years after the battle. Okay. So the conclusion is this discussion may have occurred in some form But the great argument or controversy that existed uh, between Green and Gary, I don't believe existed. Uh, Another account says that the decision to uh, entrench was kind of a organic, spontaneous uh, effort that goes on with all of the brigade commanders. I mean, you're up on a hill, you know you're gonna get attacked. You don't Mm. need someone to tell you to do that. So that's uh, that's my take on that. I wonder if Bob has any other thoughts on that. A um, couple places I want to go real quick here. First, George Sears Green is the statue you see at the top of Colts Hill, usually considered the savior of Colts Hill. He's one of these brigade commanders in um, Geary's division, and he is a West Point engineer. He is well respected. He's, I think, 62 years old. He's the oldest brigadier general in the Union Army. And uh, I believe it's his men that start building the breastworks first. And I think that example, it, it's kind of natural, though, don't you think, Bruce? If you're getting ready to sure. receive an attack and you've got all this wood around here and boulders, which you can incorporate into it. Well, sure. Yeah. yeah. It's and, like if I, if I fall in the water, nobody needs to tell me to swim. Right. That's, gonna, <laughs> that's just going to happen. Right. And it, it just spread from green to to Candy and Kane's brigades and and on down. And Wadsworth's as, division, as you mentioned, first the, corps. the Iron Brigade, yep. Wadsworth's divi- uh, corps, sorry, Wadsworth's division of the First Corps was also up there. Right. So yeah, it's kind of a natural thing. But they were instrumental in, in the victory. But wasn't there wasn't there also uh, some question as to whether or not they were going to be staying there long? Like, didn't. Uh it was either Geary or Slocum or someone higher than Green kind of was under the impression that well, they're probably going to move us somewhere else soon anyway. Well, so they the, weren't really, um, you know, buying into the uh, should we entrench don't type know of about that. But of course, these men have been moved recently. They, right. they had been camping that night of July 1st just on the north slope of Little Round Top. In fact, if you go, right. if you're on the auto tour and you're going down Little Round Top, just as you come to the intersection there at um, the Wheatfield Road on the left at that north at the southwest quadrant, you'll see a little star monument that's marking the position of the 147th Pennsylvania where they were on the night of July 1st, mm. which mm. is which is is it 147th Pennsylvania. Over, they were over on uh, Little Round Top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a star monument, right. which the star, of course, is Slocum's 12th Corps that were up there. So they were moved from there early in the morning of July 1st over to Culp's Hill. And it's always been my understanding, I'm not sure I can give you a source on this, that, that almost immediately they start to build breastworks. It's just kind of a natural thing to do. Okay. No matter how long you're going to be there. Um, but, yeah, I, I, that's what I would do. And if you read later uh, contemporary accounts of that same discussion, you're usually going to see that their footnote says Fonz. 
Mm-hmm. And most folks will look at that and say, well, Fonz says that he's the gold standard. Right. But, but Fonz gives his source is that rather imprecise effort of gathering source documents by the various people that were doing burials. And of course, the, we didn't talk about the Elliott map. There's a map that lays out all of where supposedly where all of these um, Confederate and Union burials occurred. Right. Now we know there are errors in the map, but if you look at the part up on Culp's Hill, uh, I guess we're kind of getting into yeah, the next. Let's yeah, just, we're let's sort of transitioning the, into the next part. Well, since we're on, on, yeah. Can I just throw in a funny little story about breast Sure. <laughs> professor. <laughs> professor. Oh, we got the red light going. But go ahead. Some other time. No, 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 no. Don't. And ask the question no. about what. The audience the, doesn't know about the red light. The what ignore it. The just Texans, go. <laughs> when they were marching through Pennsylvania and they saw a very large. Uh, um, Mom, what shall I say? A, a woman that was amply, uh, was well endowed. <laughs> yeah. What the Texan said to her, but we'll do that some no, other no, time. No, no, no. You just spent time. Uh, you could okay. have told the so, story. <laughs> so, part of Hood's division is marching through Pennsylvania. There's a lady shaking her fist at these Confederates, and she's well endowed, and she has on her very ample bosom this brooch pin of an American flag, red, white, and blue, the star-spangled banner. And one of the Texas boys yelled out to her, ma'am, you best be careful. We Texans are awfully good at charging the Union breastworks when the colors is flying on them. I'm sorry, Bruce, I thought that was a funny story. <laughs> it was, <clears throat> if you had said it 20 minutes ago when you first brought it up. <laughs> well, remember what? 20 minutes ago, remember what I said? Well, let's talk about I breastworks, know. and then Bruce went into a very scientific description of breastworks. That's when you were trying and to... The moment was gone. <laughs> I was hoping to drop a hint there, but that didn't work. <laughs> oh, good. Touche. Well, since we're on the discussion, or the subject of Culp's Hill, uh, the hiking historian... By the way, that last question was the second question from Dan on YouTube. That's why I got confused without a name there. Anyway, uh, the hiking historian, she's trudging her way to answer these questions. Um, And mainly, actually, this one question. I vaguely remember learning about a Confederate burial pit that still remains on Culp's Hill, question mark? That that was a statement there, and you put a question mark. Possibly connected to a Maryland unit? Is this true? And if so, where is it located? (laughs) Could you you explain the burial practices more generally after the battle? There's a lot of question marks, so I made my voice go up there at the end. Bob, I mean, Bruce... Burial practices, Culp's Hill, the trench, all that stuff. What do we know about all that? Yeah, well, uh, all of the burial sites are still there. It's just a question of whether there are any bodies in them or not. Most of them are not. Uh, I think that uh, all agree that there there are definitely still remains of soldiers out on the battlefield. They weren't able to locate all of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, last one was identified in 1996. Some folks know about the discovery out at the railroad cut um, out there in the northwest part of the field. Um, but as far as the particular burial uh, site that I believe she is referring to, um, there's one, um, or believed to be one. We always qualify these with we think. Okay. Because our source on that, our most our go-to source on that tends to be this map that I started to mention a few moments ago. Right, the so Elliott map. This Elliott map, um, it's like a, well, they didn't really do topographical maps back then, not the type that we see, but it's sort of a three-dimensional type of map. And um, using a variety of sources, probably most of them being the Weaver father and son team that were overseeing much of the burials after the battle. You see, the two armies moved on after this. The Union Army uh, had enough time that they tried as much as they could to bury their own in individual graves, and those graves would be marked, and often those markings would be used to either return the remains to the families or rebury them in the Soldiers National Cemetery. Uh, Confederate dead did not get any such kind treatment. Um, It was civilians, volunteers that came in after the fact, many days after the fact, and with the decomposed condition of those bodies, they're trying to plant them into the ground as quickly as they can. Anybody that's been to Gettysburg knows how rocky the ground tends to be, which Mm -hmm. is why farm fields is where most of the burials occurred. Of course, there wasn't any farming on the top of Culp's Hill. There are a couple spots on the hill that have softer ground and by 
correlating those pieces of soft ground that we see today with the Elliott burial map, we can surmise where some of those those burial pits um, uh, were located. Right. And the one that I think is discussed the most is the one just behind the second Maryland monument on Lower Culp's Hill, which is officially Spangler's Hill. It's actually Spangler property. We okay. all call it Lower Culp's Hill. But those that take the tour uh, and go up Slocum Avenue will take a hard left turn. This is where we like to mess up buses because they get stuck on the turn. But right at the top of Lower Culp's Hill, there's a hard left turn. Just to the right of that, just to the left of the Second Maryland Monument, there's a little path that goes back there. Mm -hmm. And there's a little area that kind of looks like a soft piece of ground. And sometimes people plant flowers and Confederate flags. We believe that to be the burial pit. On the Elliott map, it shows 18 bodies there. Okay. Whether that's accurate or not, we don't know, but it correlates with that spot on the map. And it does kind of look a little like there's a depression a in the ground. Flat area. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a different looking spot. But then again, people have been visiting it and trampling over it for how long? So right. that could make it seem that way, Bob. Um, there's also a dog buried over there, or was Gracie, oh. the dog of the Second Maryland Battalion. Don't, don't tell the story. Don't, I'm going to cry. Too sad. Okay, we won't tell that but story. Go ahead, tell so it. So I have no more facts that I could add. Wait, tell the Gracie story. He has composed so well this story that if Do I were Gracie, to add anything tell tell Gracie Gracie to this story. body of facts, it would just. <laughs> Why be, are you rambling? Tell Gracie. <laughs> it would just be decomposing. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a joke. I, I ruined it. <laughs> you had a dad joke to tell. I'm sorry. But tell the Gracie story and make everybody cry, please. Oh, jeez. Why do I always have to do the crying stuff? Because you're you're good at it. I, when I tell the Gracie story, I actually start to cry, so I can't tell it. So you have to tell it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So there was this uh, dog charging with the Marylanders and... Uh, um, oh, my goodness, it's escaping me. Who Her was name was the Gracie. General? Yeah, the dog's name was Gracie. But who was the Union General? Kane. It was Kane. Thomas Kane. Um, general Kane will, will mention this dog saying something to the effect of there was a dog charging with their Marylanders. And later I, s I saw the dog was wandering on three legs amongst the bodies as if trying to make sense of the madness. Later still, she was perfectly riddled with bullets licking the hand of a dying man. I figured she was the only Christian-minded soul on the field, so I ordered her buried on the field. So as you're looking for those Confederate burials over there, you might just think of Gracie and leave a dog bone as you're going. It was there. a good Christian burial. Hiking history. Yeah. yeah. They gave a service. Christian they gave a service burial. along with it. Right. Yeah. 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 See, I didn't even, I, I tuned out because I didn't want to get teary-eyed. Ah, good. So, because, you know, everybody loves dogs, and people who don't love dogs have no souls. Okay. <laughs> Raise um, your hand in here if you love dogs. <laughs> yeah. okay, we got soulful people. <laughs> Good. Uh, by the way, I guess I should say hello to Julie and Bill, who are the studio audience today. Uh, they're sitting in. Yeah. If, if you guys have any questions on these topics, by all means, jump in. That microphone is Can working. Can the people okay? see them? No. Well, they're looking not? at me. Well, they want to see good-looking people. Man. Okay. Yeah, there there you go. go. And don't oh, turn that camera. And now there's way. Bob. No, and no. there's Bruce. <laughs> Okay. No. Uh, all right. So let's move on to the bearded historian. He says, hey, I'm pretty new to addressing Gettysburg podcast and was introduced to it through the episode you did with the tattooed historian. And man, I love your stuff. Thank you. Uh, by the way. Yeah, I did an interview on the tattooed historian. Uh, if anybody of uh, if anybody's interested in that, um, you know. I'm not that interesting. Uh, the narrative videos are awesome. Um, he means the uh, episodes. And the use of soundscapes really help bring the story to life. Uh, this will be my first submitted question, so my apologies if this has been covered in a previous Ask a Guide episode. So Gettysburg is arguably the most definitive battle in the Eastern theater and probably all the Civil War. But what would you all say is the most definitive battle in the Western theater? Is there anything that comes close to Gettysburg, Bruce? Okay. Um, we talked about this a little bit uh, in the days leading up to this, and I think that uh, most people would say Vicksburg, and uh, I, would, I would definitely have that right up there on the list. Of course, with the fall of Vicksburg, 
the entire Mississippi River is now under the control of the Union Army gunboats and the Union Navy coming up from New Orleans, and that cuts the Western Confederacy off from the rest. So now uh, Arkansas and uh, Texas and part of Louisiana are completely cut off. Okay. Um, I go back to one that happens early in the Civil War. It's kind of a sleeper, but I'll give my rationale for that. And uh, that is the Battle of Perryville. And now your listeners are scratching their heads and saying, Perry what? Um, Perryville. And I put that on my list because I'm not looking so much at a uh, part of a the strategy of a battle, who lost more men, uh, that sort of thing. But I'm looking at the larger goals of the two countries, the Union Army, the United States of America, and the self-proclaimed Confederate States of America. And um, early in the war, of course, we had the four border states, and their allegiances were right on the cusp. And what Lincoln said about the state of Kentucky is, basically, without Kentucky, all is lost. He feels it will be like a domino effect, and then Missouri will go over to the Confederacy. Uh, followed by Maryland, probably not Delaware. Um, But you know, those two extra stars in the St. Andrew's Cross, the 12th and 13th star, Mm -hmm. are for Missouri and Kentucky that had sort of exiled representation in the Confederacy. So um, early in the war, uh, Kentucky, whose legislators were primarily unionists, had proclaimed itself neutral, but they said that they would Uh, any uh, army that violated uh, Kentucky's sovereign territory, they would go in the other direction. Okay. That first violation comes in 1860, the Battle of Spring Hill. Confederates actually make an incursion into Kentucky. So now Kentucky is kind of leaning towards the Union, but Mm. it's still kind of up for grabs until we have the Battle of of, uh, Perryville. Uh, the Battle of Perryville happens in southwestern, or actually mid-western uh, um, Kentucky. Uh, it's an army led by uh, General Braxton Bragg uh, makes this incursion into the um, into that part of Kentucky. Uh, Union Army under a, a Don uh, a Carlos Buell is going to respond, and they have this battle. Now it's one of those many battles that. On paper, you could say it was a Confederate victory, but they do withdraw back into Tennessee from that. And from that point on, the Union Army has solid control over the state of Kentucky. I think it's important to note that the Battle of Perryville, which was fought on October the 8th of 1862, was kind of a companion battle to the Battle of Antietam in the Eastern Theater, which is an incursion into Maryland. So this is kind of part of a broader plan in the South, they're really realizing that their their resources are limited and they need to make something happen in a hurry. So this is kind of like a two-pronged And that was, that was by design. They said, okay, we're going to go into Maryland, you're going to go into Kentucky, or it just happened that way? Uh, no, that was by design. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so that um, is why I put that one up on the list. Uh, Bob had noted, I hadn't thought of this, but uh, it's true, you could call the Battle of Perryville is the high water mark of the Western Theater. Okay. That was the furthest incursion into the North, save save cavalry cavalry raids. raids That's the the furthest major incursion into the North by by a Confederate army in the Western Theater. So that's my sleeper for that one. I think we all agree on Vicksburg, but I think that one's pretty interesting as well. That is interesting. And then, so, but now the big ones, the other big ones, you know, you heard Vicksburg, but what about Shiloh? You think that's a... A big one or? It's a big battle. Um, Mm -hmm. But think about, again, you go back to the grand strategy. In that theater, the Union Army, see, they can't see my arms do this. (laughs) Guides point a lot and they use their hands a lot. Uh, (laughs) But in the larger scheme of things, you think about that whole series of battles to control the rivers. You say, well, geez, Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, those are pretty big battles. Yes, but the goal hasn't been accomplished. Mm. They're starting to tighten a noose around the Confederacy as they move up from um, up from uh, New Orleans with the navies and down uh, through Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee with the army. 
So really Same the thing whole with, fight in the the whole Western theater is about getting control of the Mississippi. Yeah, so so you start with Fort Donaldson and Henry. You've got the Cumberland uh, and the Tennessee rivers flowing into the Ohio, mm-hmm. and then they work their way down to the Mississippi. Then you've got the Battle of Shiloh. So these are incremental okay. successes that are part of a grander strategy. Got it. Okay. Can, I, can I speak to Shiloh just a touch, though? Sure. Yeah, Maybe she. in the what-if category. Albert Sidney Johnson is going to die there, a man who always had a tourniquet with him. Except um, for that one point, point in time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was, at the start of the war, considered up, right up there, maybe even better than Robert E. Lee, Albert Sidney Johnston. So yeah. the, the great A.S. Johnson will die at Shiloh. So, you know, it's one of the what-ifs categories. But also in terms of the future, um, not that Grant isn't going to have problems later on, but boy, can you imagine how the war would have been different had Grant retreated at Shiloh instead of attacking on the second day and reaping a victory out of yeah. out of defeat. Mm-hmm. Um, when Sherman says, uh, we got our butts kicked today, he says, yep, whip them tomorrow, though. And by that time, Buell's army had joined with Grant and they had the forces to counterattack and drive the Confederates back. So Shiloh, the, the, the more Americans fall in that one battle than all America's previous wars put together. It's a two-day battle in April of 1862. Of course, later that year, Antietam will, in a one-day battle, see about the same number of casualties as Shiloh did. So it was a big one. Yeah. And when, when I first thought of this question, I was thinking about throwing Shiloh out there. Of course, the obvious answer, as Bruce said, is Vicksburg. Right. Okay. So let me. Uh, I, I thought of Nashville. Well, we don't want to get into that. What are the two? Let me say. What are the three most important cities in the South when the war begins? Nolens. Nolens is the biggest. Chattanooga, I would say. Okay, I, I didn't think about that one, but certainly Richmond is the capital once Virginia yeah. secedes, and Atlanta. I mean, oh, for yeah. some, many of the same reasons that, yeah. that Chattanooga is. So I'm going to go to the Battle of Atlanta. Because of when it happens, it's not really one battle, but Atlanta will fall six weeks or so before the election. And you might mm. think Atlanta is a, is a Eastern battle, isn't it? Well, but it was that Western army that Grant had commanded. Right. Now they under went command east. of Sherman. Yeah. And now they're, they, uh, they will seize Chattanooga, then they will seize Atlanta, and that's just before the election. And it was not that's a given a, yeah. that, ele- that Lincoln would have won the 1864 election because right. Grant's army, well, it wasn't Grant's army, it was still Meade's army, but the Army of the Potomac was stalemated for ultimately 10 months in the, the trenches of Richmond. So the, the fall of Atlanta just before the election is going to lead to a landslide victory. That's interesting because it's, yeah, it's a military thing that affects a political situation. Correct. And remember the Democratic Party's platform, not that McClellan embraced it. He was the Democratic candidate in 1864. Right. The, the famous George McClellan that was fired after Antietam. But the platform of the Democratic Party was a peace platform. Right, we'll, right. We'll end the war. Right. You vote for us, we'll end the war. Right. So, yeah, I'm going to go with Atlanta. It's still yellow. That means we're still in time. Interesting. Well, we, we always like to think of these Napoleonic tipping points. In yeah. other words, there is a point in any event beyond which the outcome has already been determined. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't know that until later. I look at the Civil War, even even parts of the Civil War, like the Battle of Gettysburg, and I think it's hard to, to single out one or even two or three sure. tipping points. Sure, yeah. They're all tipping points in different ways. So, right. Yeah. Well, I used to ask my students to write an essay on what was the most important battle or military encounter of the war. And there is no right answer. Many of them will write about Gettysburg. Many will write about Vicksburg. Those are the two biggies. Mm-hmm. But if a student would make a good case for first bull run as early as that was when the gateways to Washington was open, I mean, who knows what would have happened, but I could even accept that as a decent answer as long as they had well, a good rationale. Well, you could say that rationale. that was a turning point because it, it sobered up the American mindset as to what this was well, going to be. Exactly, and, yeah. it, and it stiffened Washington to realize we had better get some forts built <laughs> yeah. around here. Yeah, and right. then they called Steve Fan and said, yeah, right. Steve, help us with the forts. A reference to one of the winter lecturers, and if he's, he's, he's up there already, right? He's on the website. Steve oh, yeah, lecture. yeah, Steve's yeah. up there, okay. yeah, and he's on Page's uh, episode was on Patreon last and week. And we did an so. interview with him, too. Good. Right. So, um, Okay. So, yeah. Well, that was uh, anything you want to add to that, Bruce? No, oh, that's okay. good. Yep. All right. Let's take a quick break and uh, we'll come back uh, after word from our sponsor. 
Think outside the bus and let Getty's Bike Tours show you the only way to truly experience Gettysburg. There's a reason why Getty's Bike Tours is the longest running bicycle tour company in Gettysburg, and that's because they put the customer's experience at the top of their list of priorities. Follow a licensed battlefield guide through some of the most legendary ground in American history. There's a tour route for everyone, from the newbie to the hardcore history buff. So go to GettysBike.com or call 717-752-7752 and book your reservation today. Mention addressing Gettysburg and receive 10% off your tour. That's GettysBike.com or 717-752-7752. Discount does not apply to rentals. Uh, my favorite place to go, Mason Dixon Distillery. They create their award-winning spirits from grain grown on Gettysburg National Military Park. And they cook their comfort food from ingredients sourced from local farms. For great food, amazing drinks, engaging conversation, and plenty of on-site parking, which is really hard to find here in Gettysburg, head over to Mason Dixon Distillery located at 331 East Water Street. Mention you heard this ad on addressing Gettysburg and get a free dessert with any meal. That's right. I said free just because you mentioned this show. That's Mason Dixon Distillery, 331 East Water Street, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. What's up, guys? My name's John. I am the Tattooed Historian. And if you want friction-free history, edgy, new, exciting, you're going to want to check out my podcast, The Tattooed Historian Show, on iTunes or Spotify. Victorian Photography Studio, located on Steinware Avenue in historic downtown Gettysburg, is a vintage tintype and digital portrait studio. With hundreds of dresses and uniforms, as well as period-correct props and backgrounds, VPS can help you capture the perfect moment in time. As one of the few remaining practitioners of the craft, the photographers at VPS are trained in the history and artistry of wet plate collodion photography. So stop on in or book online for a truly unique Gettysburg experience. Go to VictorianPhotographyStudio.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram at VPS underscore Gettysburg. That's VictorianPhotographyStudio.com and at VPS underscore Gettysburg on social media. Okay, I know spots like these are annoying, but... But they're a necessary evil when it comes to free content, so here we go. There are three ways to support this show and the Addressing Gettysburg project as a whole. One, the most effective way, is becoming a monthly subscriber at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash addressing Gettysburg. Our patrons receive access to interviews with experts recorded especially for them. Number two, the fun way by getting some merch over at our store at addressinggettysburg.com. Show that you are in the know by wearing one of our t-shirts, hoodies, or other items at addressinggettysburg.com. And number three, the free way. You shop at Amazon like everyone else, so why not make those unnecessary sales that only make you feel guilty anyway count for something? Every time you want to go and shop on Amazon, go to addressinggettysburg.com first, then click that Amazon banner at the top of the homepage, then sign in and shop like you normally would. The beauty of this is that Amazon gives us credit for qualifying sales while it doesn't cost you one cent more than you intended to spend in the first place. But you gotta make sure that you do it every time you shop Amazon. Okay there, we're finished with the obligatory pitch for your support. <laughs> Man, our Patreon patrons must be laughing right now saying, we don't have to sit through commercials on Patreon. Wink. Hey, everybody, we're back. I got a question from the peanut gallery in the uh, live Instagram video here from Eric. He says, what's the story on fortification, fortifications along Seminary Ridge and are there any remnants? Bob and I have uh, had experience with this uh, a couple of uh, Ask a Guides ago when Jim oh, Pangburn was on. Oh, that the time when you had too much to drink and you just fell over the... the yeah. And I said, hey guys, I think I stumbled on the remnants <laughs> That was a joke, fortification. Matt drink. Much. Yeah, I stopped drinking. I stopped drinking a lot. Um, yeah, no, you, you, me, and Jim went putzing around the battlefield mm -hmm. after doing an Ask a Guide, mm -hmm. and he showed us the remnants of some fortification, or I guess these would be breastworks, on um, Seminary Ridge. Want to tell them where? Uh, near the McMillan Farm. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you're on the auto tour route and you're heading 
just you've gone through the seminary heading south on Seminary Ridge Avenue and then West Confederate Avenue after you hit the traffic light. The f- you get all these modern houses and things like that. But then there's a little bit open space with cannons and there's a big white house. That's where the, the McMillan house. family lived mm-hmm. during the battle. I'm going to buy that one day after I make my second million off of the podcast. Yeah. Well, yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> you know that a guy owns that. Anyway. Well, um, not going to be there forever. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, it's just kind of opposite, just west of the McMillan farm. And it's not marked or anything like that. But if you kind of walk around there, you can see uh, you can see the the rock wall still to the yeah. north in front of the trees. That was obviously where the Union This would have been um, Gamble's brigade of Buford's right, were right. defending on the first day. Here, at the what, day what if you do it like this? You, you're going out to uh, Confederate Avenue from town, let's say, on Middle Street. And you make a left at the top of the hill mm-hmm. at the light. Now, on your right is going to be a stone wall. There's some cannon and some markers. These are behind the wall, which is a little weird because it's like, well, wait a second. How? Because the brigade marker plaques are facing away from you. Mm -hmm. But that's another topic for another day. But that follow that wall. The hell is that? Are we are we dying or what's going on? (laughs) What is that? Bruce's phone, I think. Is it your phone, Bruce? Yeah, I think it's Bruce's phone. No, it's not. Is it the... Somebody's... Okay. We're about to blow up. <laughs> Get behind him. I don't, I don't, I don't even know where it's light. coming from. Is it the traffic light? It's the oh. speaker. It's the speaker? Oh. oh. Shall oh, I wait, unplug hold it? Hold on a second. It's the timer. This is that, exciting. I, I use Thank the you. timer. Julie to the rescue! <laughs> Yay, Thank you, Julie. Julie. I use the timer on the um, on on Google because I can you know I'm, I'm, my face wouldn't get into your phone, and so the time I didn't know the timer on Google beeps when it runs out of time. So that was I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, so you take that wall. What were we talking? We about? were talking about the <laughs> seminary ridge entrenchments uh, or, or breastworks. So you take that wall, just follow that stone wall into the field. It ends and it goes into a field. Now the thing is, from the road. You look into that field, you just see an orchard. But tea, if you, but, tea trees. But when you've seen it, you will. When you've been there, you'll see. Oh, and now I can even yeah. see it. You have. But the, th- right. the the trick is, you can't just look from the road and say, "Oh, there they are." You right. actually have to look at it from the side. And the best way to do that is walk down along that road, and you'll see it. Mm-hmm. And then you could actually go and walk in them, and you'll see that there is definitely. Um, just some change in the topography there. Anywhere else that you guys know about on Seminary, on Seminary Ridge? Ridge? No. No. I think, yeah, I haven't heard of any others either, but I'm sure I mean, there's probably there, something. Yeah. I don't think anything extant. Right. Or in still in existence. Yeah. Extant. Yeah. I like that word. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then uh, let's see. Do we have any more from the Peanut Gallery in here? Okay. Darth Etzcorn. That's another beer. Uh, 151st Pennsylvania saw action hold on it, it what? These, these, what about the favorite? General? We're gonna get. We're gonna get to. We're gonna get Bob. Oh, I'm not. You said these, these went in here. The, yeah, no, these, I know. These are live. Are these are new. coming in live. Yeah. Oh man. So oh, I'm getting them in. Ooh, I'm getting the them deer in. in the headlight. The heat is on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are just coming in live, and I'm gonna get them out of the okay. way before we get to the Barbara Walters question. 151st Pennsylvania saw action on day one, and on day three. How many other Union units saw action on at the outset of the battle and again during Pickett's Charge? So well, does it have to be Pickett's the, Charge? It doesn't have Can to be, be Pickett's Charge because he started with day one and day three. Let's keep it on that theme. So how many other ones, day one and day three? Of course, this is off the top of your head. So it, Six Wisconsin? Six Wisconsin. Iron Brigade, and they're fighting over on the morning of July 3rd on Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill. Right. 14th Brooklyn. Okay. Um, but then it's all Culp's Hill stuff. So the first and the third. So, uh, boy, Bruce, there was a, there was, I, I don't have the regiment number, but I know there was an 11th Corps regiment that fought hard on Culp's Hill. Uh, that was, uh, I think that maybe was more on July the 2nd, though. Yeah, the so, 82nd Illinois, maybe? Uh, I don't, no, I don't think it was them. Um yeah, boy, he's got us on the spot here. He's stumped the chunks. Yeah, Sam Pickett's yeah. charge. That's the thing for that. But I'm so he's out. asking Pickett's charge. So what were there any first corps units in Pickett's charge or eleventh corps units? 
It was well, mostly they're, they're second, was artillery it? fire. Well, yeah, but isn't everybody? I, but I, I think he's asking, did they shift over to the angle? Is that the is that Not that's more. particularly? Is that what you're asking, Darth? Did they shift over to the angle, or to any part of that line that was coming under attack from those four divisions or parts of four divisions? Somebody just said, "Oh my God, I thought that beeping was in my house." <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> no, that was us. <laughs> All the fire department. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, no. So there you go. Uh, we don't really have a lot. Uh, but actually, off the top of their head, it, you know, and that's a tough question to ask people off the top of the question. Uh, no, just in general, what, Darth? Okay. Well, whatever. Um, okay. So let's let's end uh, here with this big one here from the great Trinetti. He's just blowing our minds with this deep, deep question. He asks, ask them who their favorite general is and why, or who their least favorite general is and why. All right. The great Trinetti, get ready for your answer. Bruce. I'll start with favorite, um, and I will preface that with uh, the question for me is kind of like, what is your favorite food? And right now, I'd probably say filet mignon. Mm, oh, if I had delicious. it like five or six days in a row, I'd be getting tired of You'd filet. You'd be saying sushi. So my, yeah, my favorites change a little bit. Um, the obvious ones that I'd say most people talk about is either Lee or Mead. There right. tends to be this Lee camp and this Mead camp. Um, I don't want to replow that field, so I'm going to go with another sleeper here. And I'm going to preface that with a question. There's no prize here except the knowledge that you really know your stuff if you get this one. But the question for the good of the audience is, name a general who fought at Gettysburg, who entered the Civil War service as a brigadier general, had temporary command of three different infantry corps in the two different theaters of the war and left the army at the end as a brigadier general. Never being elevated above the division command. Say that again. Okay. As uh, if I'm a five-year-old. Name a general who fought at Gettysburg who entered Civil War service right. as a brigadier general. Mm -hmm. Okay. One-star general. Entered had, service as a general. Had temp Entered service. So there's a little hint hmm. there, too. Had temporary command of three different infantry corps in two different theaters, and that's a hint, um, of the war. But he left the army at the end as a brigadier general, still a one-star mm. general. Never has been elevated to Always command a anything. Bridesmaid. Was he ever? He was a brigadier general even in the United States Volunteers, and we're not just talking about the regular army here. Is that right? Well, this is not twenty questions, but come on, uh, Bob. Well, I I, I <laughs> he, know the answer. He okay, was a, I know, I know the answer. I know. He had so led I. militia. He, I'm surprised that he wasn't even. In, he in had the, he had seen service in the Mexican War, although it was late in the war, so he didn't see any heavy combat. He led militia troops. I'm not going to tell you which state. That's too much of a hint. And so he actually receives a commission as a brigadier general. Okay. All right. So entered service as brigadier general. Commanded a uh, corps of volunteers. In, uh, okay, a volunteer. Yeah. Commanded a corps in both theaters. Is that what you said? He commanded three different corps. Three core different corps in, in both two, in two, two theaters. theaters. Remained a brigadier general even at the end of the war. Is that that, that was That's the three? Right. Okay. Anybody in the live video know who that is? I want to take a guess. He fought here at Gettysburg. And it would even take them a little while to research this one. So yeah. they either know it or they don't. According to Boltner, he, he was appointed a brigadier general during the Mexican-American War. All right. So he's been a brigadier general for a while. All right. So that should give you a hint. So anyway, favorite general, though. Let me go on, let me go on to the least favorite. Go we'll ahead. come back to sure, this. Sure. So if anybody wants to respond. Um, okay. So least favorite. Um, there's a couple that I... Well, there's one guy that I ruled out... He was my least favorite for a period of time until I took a tour with descendants of his. Um, I took a tour with the father and daughter. It was an eight hour bicycle tour and we stopped for lunch and they were descend they were from Pittsburgh. They were descendants of General, I believe it's Th Thomas uh, Rowley. Okay. Now Rowley is the general that fought out uh, on July the 1st. He was a first Corps general. He was a brigade commander but after General John Reynolds was killed, his division commander, Doubleday, took control of 
the Corps, and Rowley is elevated to division command. Was he was he the one who was drunk? Well, he was arrested for drunkenness. He okay. got into he was uh, giving these erratic commands. I think Stone's brigade probably suffered uh, much from his uh, erratic behavior on the battlefield. He got into an altercation, not physical, but an arguing altercation with the uh, Robinson, or uh, yeah, it would be Robinson's brigade commander, General Cutler. And actually, it's a young lieutenant that uh, sees this erratic behavior and actually places him under arrest. Really? Pretty bold move on yeah. this part of this lieutenant. So anyway, he's tried, he's court-martialed for uh, drunkenness, but he is later exonerated. Uh, they revisit the whole thing because there were extenuating circumstances. And this father and daughter were quite eager to let me know what those circumstances were as we had lunch. Now, apparently General Rowley was afflicted. Uh, delicate ears may want to tune out on this, but okay. he Children was afflicted away. with a condition as described as boils on his inner thighs <laughs> and posterior uh, the size of hen's eggs. Oh, oh Matt, uh, I'd be drinking too. <laughs> and they were sort of Googling and sharing this with me over lunch. The fact that I had ordered a chef salad didn't help one bit. <laughs> uh, but in fact, I did revisit that. And uh, in fact, that is a truthful account. And he was exonerated. So I feel like, you know, a guy that has boils the size of hen's eggs, you gotta cut him a little slack there. Yeah, right. Um, Alfred Iverson would be high on that list. Uh, Iverson was the mm. Confederate Brigade commander who uh, was really not exercising any kind of coherent uh, control over his brigade, which basically walked into an ambush on July the 1st up there uh, on Oak Ridge. So, okay, that can close the Boatner Dictionary on Iverson since I'm not going there. <laughs> oh, well, you can give them the details on that. No. Yeah, 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 I have other ideas. Remember, we, we okay. said if you, and I didn't tell you, you take about one, that. I said you take one and leave something for me. So, well, the, 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 the one that I really chose, and I, I, didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time on this because I don't really uh, have much besides my own impressions, uh, is General uh, Alfred uh, Pleasanton. Head of the uh, head of the uh, Cavalry Corps in the Union Army at Gettysburg, uh, he's my least one of my least favorite on a couple accounts. Uh, first of all, is at Gettysburg, Iverson, uh, not Iverson. We're back on Pleasanton now. Excuse me, Pleasanton um, is going to make some decisions that don't seem to be very productive. It was Pleasanton that ordered John Buford's cavalry, who were guarding the left flank of the Union Army, uh, to move back to uh, Westminster and take a little rest because they had fought hard, okay. which probably rankled the men of the 1st and the 11th Infantry Corps. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. who didn't fight hard on July the 1st? <laughs> uh, so that leaves General Dan Sickles' left flank exposed, which is one of the factors that he's considering when he makes his move. So. Uh, that wasn't too cool. The other one is that uh, General Pleasanton apparently was not uh, appreciating the importance of the rear of the Union Army at the intersection of the Low Dutch Road and the Hanover Road. He's actually uh, going to uh, give several orders that, that have uh, General Gregg's Cavalry Division moving around and potentially leaving that intersection in guard, unguarded. Okay. Uh, Greg pretty much takes it upon himself to ignore uh, Pleasanton and do what he wants to do. And that's where we have the issue of Custer leaving and coming back and Kilpatrick going down and uh, all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part of Pleasanton is he just wasn't a nice guy. He's kind of a self-serving, blowhard, braggart. Yeah. And you, you read accounts from the other generals and he wasn't... He wasn't a, a very well-liked general, so. Was he competent? He had fought competently in certain situations. I believe, well, he eventually is, um, he eventually is replaced by, uh, oh, help me, Bob, I'm drawing a blank here, down, uh, uh, down um, General um, Sheridan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, he's, I was he's looking super, at something. He's huh? superseded by Sheridan, and he ends up going out uh, west. And apparently, he conducts uh, himself uh, competently in those later battles. But 
It's just a guy I don't like. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> That's my story. Uh-huh. How about you, Bob? Um, like Bruce, there's a favorite du jour, right? Um, any day of the week you ask me, I'll say Hancock. Many days I'll say Mead. Um, right now, though, I'm, I'm going someplace just be, to be a little unique. Um, a man you don't think about as a great general at Gettysburg, but was a general at Gettysburg. He was 34 years old. Carl Schurz. I'm, I'm not sure I'm exactly pronouncing his name. Schurz? Right. Schurz, yeah. yeah okay. The, the, the German-American. Right. And I just, I'm impressed with uh, the man's courage. Maybe not necessarily here at Gettysburg or how he handled troops here at Gettysburg, but um, he's 34 at Gettysburg. And in 1848, what's that? That's 15 years earlier? So he's, what, 19 or so years old? He is a democratic revolutionary in fighting in Germany, mm. in those failed revolutions in Germany. Um, he had been studying at the University of Bonn uh, to be a, a history professor, and he had come under the influence of a professor named Gottfried Kunkel. And um, he had escaped Rostad, Germany, uh, a disaster there for them. And he had to climb through the sewers to get out. Oh, <laughs> you know, this is a 19 year old year old guy. And uh, then he will find out that his professor mentor, Kunkel, was being kept in, the, in Berlin in uh, the Spandau prison that supposedly you can't get out of. And he will sneak in there and rescue him. And uh, he's, he's being pursued and he'll get to Switzerland and England and eventually America. And he's bringing some of those democratic ideas and a lot of those 11th Corps soldiers out there on the first day that people call the damn Dutch mm. they were fighting for a kind of government that they believed in and and they were not the flying Dutchmen they were they were deserving of some respect so there Carl Schurz okay Carl Schurz okay. I like that um, and of course I wanted to go to Iverson too because he's easy to pick up well I left all sorts of <laughs> no, that's all, all right all sorts of stuff with so uh, well, I know we're running short really short in time too so uh, I'm going to just say AP Hill for my for least favorite least favorite yeah. why because he's in bed with he's not day? Daniel Harvey his bro- uh, not his brother but the other the, the, the better of the two hills okay he's the lesser hill but um, but he wore a red shirt yeah he wore red shirts uh, <laughs> for not the reason that joke is talking about but uh, he's uh, you don't know that joke never mind we want to go there no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> oh man I got too too many jokes anyway um, yeah he's he's he, 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 AP Hill AP what can Hill, I say not he, one of your favorites he's not where he's supposed to be when the battle begins on the first day right he's stumbling into it blindly and he's not taking he's he's ill I mean he, yeah. he's got problems his whole life and sure because we have young listeners maybe just, well, Maybe he just mom, do look it up stupid why he's mistakes. Ill. <laughs> he can just yeah, say youthful he, he, indiscretions. Youthful just, indiscretions. He made mistakes when he was younger, and they haunted him the rest right. of his life. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there's my answer. All right. Um, just to go back to a question earlier from Darth Escorn. Well, hold about, it, Matt. What would you say? Who favorite general? Least favorite oh. general. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um, well, again, like both of you said, it's uh, favorite du jour. Um, right now, I'm really liking Mead a lot more than I had ever really given him much thought, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but the more I learn about him, the more I like him. Listen to the podcast that Jim Pangburn was yeah. on. Yeah, and guy. it was really because uh, when Mead came up and Jim started yelling and throwing things, that I really understood <laughs> that <laughs> that Mead was uh, probably uh, a better general than. Uh, we give him credit for, but no, Mead. I like Mead because he's he's uh, steady, and he isn't afraid to let his subordinates uh, do their jobs. And um, but he he consults them. He doesn't just not unlike Lee, who just kind of seems to throw out an order, not realizing who he's throwing the order to, and then expecting it all to be taken care of, and then they're, you know, not doing it. And thus, or at least that's the way it seems. Thus, like. Matt lost all the <coughs> Southern listeners yeah, to sorry, Jackson, boys. Gettysburg. <laughs> no, but on the South, I like Longstreet. Mm-hmm. Um, um, why do I like Longstreet? Probably because I think he's been scapegoated a lot, and I always tend to uh, as a guy who's always criticized, I, I've learned that um, your people that get on you, it says more about them than it says about you. And so I owe it, but it still hurts. 
So I always kind of felt a little sympathetic to him. But then the more I looked into it, the more I realized that he's just getting railroaded by people who can't admit that Bobby Lee lost the Battle of Gettysburg. There you go. And uh, I, when I was younger, Custer was a big favorite of mine. Heresy. But that's just because I yeah. know. But that's just because he uh, he was uh, a circus clown. You know, I I, I, I admired that whole thing as a young man when I used to have long hair. But now that I'm bald, um, Custer can go to hell. But uh, I don't know. I mean, as far as the generals go, I don't really have a least favorite, I think. I think the more you... The more I learn about them, the more I see them as human beings who are flawed, just like everybody else. Um, I would agree with Pleasanton, though. Like, I've always read that he was just kind of an ass, and uh, I don't like asses. Well... All right, so let's get back to uh, the one question before that Darth Escorn asked. Oh, did so, anyone get it? Anybody come in? <laughs> well, somebody came in and said, <clears throat> "Excuse me." Somebody came in and said, uh, "I think something about Stone's Brigade down in that area." So I went into Brigades of Gettysburg, the book by uh, Gilbert, not Gilbert, <laughs> Bradley Gottfried, and. Let's see, I got this little part here that I'll read to you. Arriving near, this is on July 2nd, arriving near the position of Humphrey's division, the men were ordered to fix bayonets and prepare to charge. Night fell without orders to charge. Uh, Not all of the troops remained there, for the 149th and 150th Pennsylvania were ordered towards the Emmitsburg Road to ascertain the position of the enemy and to recover two abandoned cannons. John Badler of the 149th wrote, Home that uh, wrote home that the rebels have our flag, but we took one cannon from them in return the next day. As they struck the road, gunfire rang out in the darkness, and the men were pulled back to a position between the Emmitsburg Road and the Tawny Town Road, where they remained all night. Private John Nesbitt of the 149th Pennsylvania decided to start a ghost tour company, and he recalled that the men's Nobody got that? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, And he recalled that the men, quote, spent the night when not on duty carrying water from the well at the Kodori house to the wounded of both armies. It was a long and sleepless night. The cries and moans of the wounded and dying, the close proximity of the rebel pickets kept the boys awake and nervous. Two Confederate cannon opened on the 150th. Uh, Pennsylvania at dawn on July 3rd, killing and wounding several men. The brigade moved north soon after to a position several hundred yards southeast of the clump of trees that would be the target of Pickett's division later that day. Despite having the protection on the reverse slope of Cemetery Ridge, the men immediately threw up rudimentary breastworks. Not having tools, they created a barricade of rails and stones. This complicate I'm sorry, this completed many of the following men. Many of the men finally caught up on their sleep after a long night of picket duty or caring for the wounded. The initial artillery rounds preceding the picket Pettigrew Trimble charge caught some members of the 149th out of the breastworks. Um, killing and wounding several of them. The men quickly rushed to the breastworks, but casualties mounted, including minor ones from flying splinters from the breastworks. Captain John Musser of the 149th described the cannonade as, quote, such a storm of shell and solid shot was never heard before. No place was safe. They passed through the regiment, killing and wounding, bursting over us, plowing through the earth under, under us. It was our duty to remain where we were. According to Musser, his regiment lost four killed and 21 wounded in the cannonade. Later, some of the men apparently fired at Pickett's men during the charge, but it is doubtful that they had much of an impact. Okay, so you're going, you're taking that back to the, somebody that was fighting on all three days. Correct. Okay. First yep. day and third okay. day. And then, but specifically Pickett's charge, because remember he said... Okay. Did anybody fight for on the first and a picket's charge? So, and then I think it was Eric. Uh, Eric, what's your last name? Yeah, Eric Moni or Moni, M O H N E Y. Um, he's the one that tipped me off to Stones Brigade. So thank you for that, Eric. Um, okay. The quiz question. The quiz question. Did anybody yes. come back? Uh, the only answer that we got was green. That was close. It was close, but no. Okay, correct. so the answer is. Alphaeus Williams. So Williams, Williams was the first first division commander in the uh, 12th Infantry Corps. 
Um, hmm. He writes a lot of, of letters. There's a book, uh, it's the in, in the Mouth of the Canon, and it's a collection of his letters to his daughter, which are quite revealing. But if you can read those, if you read those uh, uh, reports and communications, you say, gosh, you know, Williams, you're a, you're a good guy, you're a solid performer, but I think you're starting to tick off some people with <laughs> with those communications. Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of a lengthy deal, but but I like him because he's a he's a solid guy. He, yeah. He's not a flashy guy. He just goes out and gets the job done. And I find it incredible that somebody with that much experience goes four years, never a major screw up except maybe on the political front. Yeah. And he goes out as a brigadier general. That's uh, that's crazy. That's sad. Mm-hmm. Too bad. He does later in 1865. After everything's all over, they award him. Um, Retroactively, a, uh, a major, a major general. Yeah, I think it's a major general brevet of brevet. volunteers. Yeah. And yeah. Now it was for, January of '65, though. So, so the war was still on, on. but it was no, just it, a brevet. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. an official promotion. Yeah. What uh, for for the people who are new to all of this, uh, like Julie, for example, what what is what does brevet mean? Temporary, temporary, honorary. Yeah. Did honorary? Did they get paid? Well, it's more than honorary. Honorary. Did they? If if you were like Custer, for example, he's jumped from captain to brevet brigadier general. And I believe at the end of the war he was a major general. Bre- all brevets, though. I believe they they received the pay. That's my. They received the pay. While they're there, but then when the war is over, they go back to their uh, regular regular army status. Exactly. So they, he was a brevet major general of volunteers. Of volunteers right. But in the regular army, he was still a captain. Is that how that works? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in, yeah, okay. Yeah, it depends yeah. what he was to right. begin with, right? And then after the war, I think he goes to lieutenant colonel. Which is why, colonel. when you hear about Custer at the Little Bighorn, people say, well, "When did he get busted?" You know, he's a general, and now he's a colonel. He was never busted. Right. We'll do Custer another time. I'm trying to get some Custer people on. Anyway, we uh, we do have to go. We are running out of time. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Bruce, for coming in. It was a very good job. Very well researched. And Bob, as always, thank you. And then uh, Bill and Julia over there, uh, thank you for coming. Is, in is there a here. live mic that they could grab? Yeah, grab that microphone there. Go ahead, and then just turn the little and switch on. And you can on. say no. <laughs> just real quick, what, what's oh, your she favorite gives, general? She gives it right to or him. Or least favorite general. Go ahead, Bill. Bill's Bill, taking it. Bill knows. Julie doesn't know. <laughs> you got to speak like right into that mic. Kind of like the gentleman. It's a, it's a of the day kind of thing. But I think um, with some of the reading I've done lately. Bill, games, right up to the mic. Some of the reading I've done lately. It's been Buford. Oh, um, yeah, that's another good for one. For identifying what he thought was a, a good field of battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then having the, the fortitude to slug it out until... Hopefully somebody came here to, to to back him. So I give him I give him credit for that. Um, least favorite, I probably with you gentlemen because he's an easy target. But Iverson, um, I think that was just uh, just poor poor conduct all the way around. Yeah, you know, a lot of men paid for that. Good How about choices. rally? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, you know, that's the, the two I've got. Yeah, and you know what? I, I, didn't, I don't know why I didn't think of this. My least favorite is Sickles. I can't stand Sickles. <laughs> I can't stand Sickles. And I can't stand people who love him think he's the greatest thing in the world. He is no guide's least favorite because there's so many good stories about him. Well, I'm not a guide. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> all right, everybody. Have yourself a good one, and uh, we'll see you next time.